It's a chilly night in late September. The distant hum of traffic outside my window forces me to turn up the volume on my TV. I'm tired, but sleep won't come. So I do what anyone would do in this situation. Try to drown out the restlessness with mindless television. I'm flipping through channels, not really sure what I'm looking for. News? Definitely not. True crime? Not the vibe right now. A movie? Too much brain power. Then suddenly, this. What is this? It's strange, unsettling, definitely not the kind of content this channel usually plays. There's something about it that feels off, like I'm seeing something that wasn't meant to be seen, something hidden, something archived away, never intended for public eyes. I think it is lost media, the kind of content buried in time, forgotten by most, or intentionally suppressed. But why? Was it a film that was destroyed with no surviving copies? An old TV segment from the 60s that no one thought to record? Maybe a song that was never released? Or photographs in the possession of just one person? Or worse, it could be a video so dark, so disturbing, that it's been locked away deemed too dangerous for anyone to watch. Of course, in reality, I hadn't discovered any lost media. It's just the QVC channel, which honestly I didn't even know I had. But while searching for new topics to dive into, I came across a piece of lost media that instantly grabbed my attention. It took me back to being a kid staying up late sneaking in cartoons while my parents slept because i wasn't allowed to watch tv past 10 pm finding random cartoons on obscure channels was always a thrill like uncovering a hidden gem i'm just glad that none of those late night shows that i watched turned out to be something like this cartoon a cartoon called The Pogrom of Mickey Mouse. In the 1930s, a Polish cartoonist named Jan Joros harbored a deep resentment towards Disney and its iconic character, Mickey Mouse. Driven by his disdain, Joros created a controversial short film intended to publicly shame Disney before the onset of World War II. This film depicted a distorted version of Mickey Mouse in a dark and surreal narrative, far removed from his usual cheerful persona. In it, Mickey is subjected to brutal bullying, torture, and death at the hands of grotesque Polish creatures, possibly reflecting an attempt to drive Mickey off of their native land. Despite extensive searches by media historians and collectors, no verified copies or substantial evidence of this short have ever been found. It is believed that the film was never completed or released to the public, likely due to its disturbing content, which may have been deemed too frightening for children. The only remaining trace of this lost media is a photograph and a brief mention in the book Mickey I. Mises, which covers pre-war animation. As you can see, even from this still, it was definitely not something that was meant to be viewed by children. It looks quite extreme, a public execution of a beloved character. The story of this short 
underscores a chilling aspect of lost media. That sometimes, such content is lost for a reason. It's unsettling nature, rendering it better left unseen. We've gone down this rabbit hole before, as it is perhaps one of my favorite topics to research. And thus, I bring you Dark Lost Media, Volume 2. Rene Hartevelt was born in 1955 in the Netherlands, growing up in a culturally enriched environment that fostered her early love for literature and the arts. Raised in a family that valued education and intellectual pursuits, Hartevelt was encouraged to explore her academic interests from a young age. Her formative years were marked by a keen curiosity and a profound appreciation for languages, which eventually led her to pursue French literature, leading her to enroll at the Sorbonne in Paris, where she pursued her studies with dedication and enthusiasm. While at Sorbonne, René Hartevelt met Isai Sagawa, a Japanese international student who shared her passion for literature. The two quickly struck up a friendship, bonding over their mutual academic interests and the shared experience of being expatriates in Paris. Hartevelt, open-minded and compassionate, saw Sagawa as a kindred intellectual spirit, unaware of the darker impulses lurking beneath his exterior. Her natural kindness and curiosity drew her closer to him, not knowing that Sagawa harbored macabre and sinister intentions, intentions that would ultimately lead to an unimaginable tragedy. Sagawa was born on the 26th of April, 1949, in Kobe Hyogo Prefecture, to wealthy parents. Sagawa was born prematurely, and reportedly was small enough that he could fit in the palm of his father's hand. He immediately developed enteritis, a disease of the small intestine. Sagawa eventually recovered after several injections of potassium and calcium in saline. Sagawa's fragile health and introverted personality led him to develop a strong interest in literature, but he also developed another strange fascination as he continued to grow, a penchant for the desire of cannibalism. In fact, Sagawa first experienced cannibalistic desires while in the first grade, after seeing a man's thigh his depraved mind continued to grow through his early years, and he committed sexual acts on his dog and continued to experience cannibalistic desires, especially for women, daydreaming about eating the flesh of various women he would see in his everyday life. When he was 24 and studying at Wako University in Tokyo, Sagawa followed a tall German woman home and broke into her apartment while she was asleep. His plan was to cut off a piece of her flesh and sneak away, intending to commit an act of cannibalism. However, the woman woke up in the middle of his attack and according to Sagawa, managed to fight him off and push him to the ground. He was arrested and charged with attempted murder, but he never admitted his true intentions to the police. Eventually, the charges were dropped after Sagawa's father paid a settlement to the victim. In 1977, at the age of 28, Sagawa moved to France to pursue a PhD in literature at the Sorbonne in Paris. Sagawa later admitted, Almost every night, I would bring a prostitute home and attempt to shoot them. 
but for some reason my fingers froze. I couldn't pull the trigger. This chilling confession revealed the disturbing thoughts that plagued him while living in Paris, foreshadowing the dark events that would later unfold, because soon Sagawa would meet Rene Hartevelt. On June 11, 1981, Sagawa invited Hartevelt to his apartment in Paris under the guise of translating poetry for a school assignment. Sagawa, who viewed himself as weak, ugly, and small, he was only four foot nine, planned to kill her and eat her, believing that he could absorb her health and beauty. While Hartevelt was reading a Johann Robert Becker poem about death, Sagawa shot her with a rifle. Sagawa said he fainted after the shock of shooting her, but awoke with the realization that he had to carry out his plan. Sagawa sexually assaulted her body, but claimed he couldn't bite into her skin because his teeth weren't sharp enough. He left the apartment and purchased an electric knife. Using the knife, he removed over seven kilos of meat from her body and consumed her flesh over the next three days, cooking several meals and continuing to perform sexual acts with her corpse. To add to the horror, Sagawa filmed almost everything, from the butchery of Hartevelt's body over several days to his lewd actions with it. In fact, he began filming before he even shot her, capturing her murder and even her final words on tape. He also shot a total of 39 photographs, showing several stagings he made with the corpse. Days later, when the remaining parts of her body began decomposing, he attempted to dispose of them in a lake in the Bois de Boulogne, carrying them in two suitcases. However, he was caught and arrested by French police. The rest of Hardevelt's body the rifle, the butchery photos, the tape recorder, as well as several other pieces of evidence were found in his apartment. The alleged tapes are presumed to be in possession of French police and have never been shown to anyone outside of that department for obvious reasons. Sagawa's wealthy father provided a lawyer for his defense and after being held for two years awaiting trial, Sagawa was found legally insane and unfit to stand trial by the French judge who ordered him held indefinitely in a mental institution. Despite the horrific natures of his crime, Sagawa was deported to Japan where he was never formally prosecuted. Frustratingly, he was able to walk free after 1986, having spent only five years in asylums. Sagawa gained notoriety and profited from his infamy, writing books and giving interviews, much to the public's outrage. In a 2011 interview with Vice, Sagawa claimed that being forced to make a living as a known murderer and cannibal was in itself a terrible punishment. He eventually died of natural causes in 2022, leaving behind a legacy marked by criticism of both the French and Japanese justice systems for their failure to keep him imprisoned. The Rene Hartevelt murder tapes are one of the most chilling examples of lost media, representing a grotesque crime and a disturbing glimpse into human depravity. They remain unseen by the public, preserved only in police archives. Their deliberate concealment highlights a broader truth about lost media, some content is kept hidden due to its horrible nature, serving as a stark reminder of the boundaries society imposes to safeguard its moral integrity. In 2013, a documentary called Blackfish was released 
delivering a powerful critique of SeaWorld and the broader practice of keeping animals in captivity for entertainment. The film focused on the life and incidents surrounding a killer whale named Tillicum, as well as his trainer, Don Brochaw. Tillicum, an orca with a troubled history, exhibited increasingly aggressive behavior during his time at SeaWorld, a result of his prolonged captivity, which many believe eroded his mental well-being. Orcas are highly intelligent creatures capable of forming strong emotional connections and harboring grudges. Tragically, during a performance with Dawn, Tillicum's aggression culminated in a fatal incident that shocked both the theme park industry and the public. An incident which was caught on camera. Tillicum was captured in November 1983 off the coast of Iceland, just two years after being born. He was taken from his family, a pod of wild orcas, and sold to Sealand of the Pacific, a small marine park in British Columbia, Canada. There, his life was drastically altered. In the wild, orcas swim hundreds of miles a day, live in close-knit pods, and engage in complex social behaviors. Tillicum, however, was forced into a small, dark enclosure, no bigger than 28 feet across. These conditions began to take a toll on the young orca, both mentally and physically. At Sealand, Tillicum was subjected to harsh conditions. He was regularly attacked by the older orcas he was housed with and was forced to perform tricks in exchange for food. It was here that he was involved in his first recorded incident, the death of trainer Kelty Byrne in 1991. Kelty Byrne, a 21-year-old marine biology student and part-time trainer, slipped into the orca pool at Sealand after a performance. Tillicum, along with Haida II, and Nutka 4 pulled Byrne into the water. They repeatedly submerged her, preventing her from reaching the surface. Witnesses at the scene described the orcas as playing with her like a toy, and despite her cries for help, no one was able to save her. Sealand officials claimed the whales were not acting out of aggression, but were simply curious or playing. However, Byrne's death raised serious concerns about keeping large, highly intelligent predators in such confined spaces. Following the tragedy, Sealand of the Pacific closed its doors, and Tillicum was sold to SeaWorld Orlando in 1992. SeaWorld inherited not only Tillicum's massive size, but also his troubled past. Despite his involvement in Byrne's death, SeaWorld allowed trainers to interact closely with him during shows, a decision that would later prove catastrophic. At SeaWorld, Tillicum spent hours isolated in a concrete tank and was used primarily for breeding purposes. Over his time at SeaWorld, he fathered 21 calves, further embedding his legacy in the captive whale population but during his time in solitary confinement, his mental state declined rapidly. While other orcas were more frequently used in public performances, Tillicum's role was limited to occasional shows, where strict protocols were in place to minimize human contact due to his unpredictable nature. In July 1999, Tillicum was involved in another fatal incident under bizarre circumstances. Daniel Dukes, a 27-year-old man, managed to stay in the park after closing hours. It is believed that Dukes hid inside the park and entered Tillicum's tank, either as part of a dare or to swim with the orca. The next morning, Dukes' body was found draped over Tillicum's back. He had suffered multiple injuries, including bite marks and scratches. 
and his cause of death was ruled as a drowning. While the exact sequence of events remains unclear, the incident raised more red flags about Tilikum's behavior. SeaWorld faced criticism for failing to prevent such an incident. Once again, the park downplayed Tilikum's aggression, framing the death as the result of Dukes' reckless actions rather than the orca's instability. Don Branchow was one of SeaWorld's most experienced and beloved trainers. Joining the park in the mid-1990s, she worked her way up to become a senior trainer, passionate about marine life from an early age. Branchow saw her work with orcas as more than just a job. It was her life's calling. By all accounts, she was a dedicated and compassionate trainer forming strong bonds with animals, particularly Tilikum. Branchow worked tirelessly to build trust with the orcas, and her performances with Tilikum were regarded as masterful displays of human-animal interaction. However, beneath the surface of this seemingly harmonious relationship, there was a growing concern within the park, even more so than ever about Tilikum's unpredictable behavior. On February 24th, 2010, Tilikum was involved in the most high-profile incident of his life. On that fateful day, after a routine performance, Tilikum suddenly grabbed Don Branchow by her, pulled her into the water, and proceeded to thrash her violently. The autopsy revealed that Branchow suffered several injuries including broken bones and a spinal cord, as well as multiple lacerations. Ultimately, she drowned. The incident occurred in front of horrified guests, and although SeaWorld staff quickly tried to intervene, it was too late. In the aftermath of Don Branchow's death, SeaWorld's practices were heavily scrutinized. Tilikum was temporarily removed from public performances, and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, conducted a thorough investigation leading to changes in how trainers interacted with orcas. OSHA ruled that SeaWorld had violated safety regulations, which resulted in the banning of close trainer orca interactions without physical barriers. While the event took place in front of an audience, SeaWorld had also been recording the entire interaction for internal use, as well as customary for their shows. This footage has never been released to the public, despite numerous calls for its disclosure. The footage being shown is a partial release of the incident that was used only for the documentary about Tilikum called Blackfish.
SeaWorld claims the rest of the footage is too graphic to be shown. Tilikum reportedly holds Branchow beneath the surface for extended periods, preventing her from coming up for air. Witnesses describe the scene as chaotic, with staff trying to intervene, but Tilikum repeatedly pulls her away from the pool's edge. The footage shows these injuries being inflicted as Tilikum shakes her body aggressively and also captures the frantic efforts of SeaWorld staff trying to rescue Branchow using nets and other tools, while alarms sound off in the background. The 2013 documentary Blackfish brought even more attention to Tilikum and the ethical issues surrounding orca captivity. If you have not seen it, I highly recommend it. The film explored not only Branchow's death, but also the systemic mistreatment of orcas at SeaWorld and other marine parks. Tilikum lived for another seven years after the incident, sadly spending the remainder of his life in solitary confinement at SeaWorld Orlando. He died in January 2017 from a bacterial lung infection, marking the end of one of the most infamous and controversial chapters in the history of animal captivity. The lost footage of Branchow's death remains a symbol of the secrecy and control exerted by SeaWorld. In the end, Tilikum's story forced the world to reconsider the ethics of animal captivity, leaving behind a legacy that continues to shape public opinion and the treatment of animals in entertainment. Fliege was a popular and controversial German talk show hosted by Protestant pastor Jürgen Fliege. It aired from 1994 to 2005 on ARD, one of Germany's largest public broadcasters. The show centered around personal stories, interviews, and discussions on a wide range of social, political, and spiritual topics making it one of the most watched daytime programs in Germany during its run. Jürgen Fleiger, known for his charismatic and unconventional approach as both a pastor and TV personality, often used the show as a platform to express his outspoken views on issues such as religion, spirituality, and the role of Germany in global conflicts particularly during the Yugoslav Wars. In more recent years, however, an alleged 1998 episode has gained a separate and very particular infamy among internet sleuths and lost media enthusiasts due to its supposed link to the so-called Teddy Bear Man case, which concerned a still unidentified man found dead in 1992 in Har Danger Vida National Park, Norway. On September 12, 1992, a group of hunters exploring the remote Har Danger Vida National Park in Norway, located approximately 124 miles west of Oslo, stumbled upon human remains. The body had no identification, and the condition of the remains made it difficult to even determine the individual's gender at first. It wasn't until DNA testing in 2022 that the remains were confirmed to belong to a young male, estimated to be between 22 and 27 years old at the time of death. He was modestly equipped for the outdoors, but lacked the gear necessary for a serious hiking expedition. Among his sparse belongings, the most poignant item was a worn, stuffed teddy bear, which would later become a defining feature 
of his mysterious story. The man had provisions such as bread, water, and a small amount of money, and other personal items that suggested he might have been a German national unfamiliar with Norway. He carried a map of the country and extra water bottles, despite the fact that local hikers knew the park's water sources to be safe for drinking. His unusual collection of belongings led investigators to believe that he was not an experienced hiker and had likely ventured into the area unprepared for the harsh conditions. Nicknamed Teddy Bjorn Manen or Teddy Bear Man by the Norwegian press, the young man's tragic fate and the discovery of his teddy bear gripped the public imagination. Initially, local authorities concluded that he had perished from exposure. The area where his body was found sits at an altitude of 1200 meters, a location known for its unforgiving weather, particularly during the unusually cold and rainy summer of that year. However, the timeline of his death remained uncertain. Many of his personal items found on the body, including the currency, dated back to 1991, suggesting he might have died much earlier. Recent estimates even suggest that his body could have been there for as long as two years before the discovery. Despite the extensive interest in both Norway and Germany, the investigation into Teddy Bear Man's identity and fate quickly stalled. Every missing persons case in Norway and Germany from the relevant time period was examined, but no match was found. Authorities released a forensic bust, recreating the young man's face in an effort to generate leads, but it produced no further clues. Without new evidence or any matches in missing persons databases, the case went cold. Over three decades later, the mystery of the teddy bear man remains unsolved, and his identity, as well as the circumstances surrounding his death, continue to puzzle investigators and capture public curiosity. The teddy bear man case largely faded into obscurity until 2022, when the Norwegian true crime series Asted Norge aired an episode revisiting the mysterious circumstances surrounding his death. The renewed attention sparked interest across the internet, and shortly after the episode aired, a Reddit user came forward with a potentially significant lead. According to this individual, they recalled seeing a 1998 episode of the German talk show Fleige, in which a guest spoke about her son, who had gone missing while on vacation in Norway. This claim seemed to offer a possible link between the unidentified body in Hardangenrida and a long-lost German tourist. However, the lead quickly hit a dead end. Neither Jürgen Fleige, the host of the show, nor the network that aired it could locate any episode in their archives that matched the alleged segment. Despite extensive searches through their records, no trace of this episode or the guest could be found. Additionally, while the possible breakthrough in this cold case received widespread coverage in the German media, no other viewers came forward to corroborate the Reddit user's memory of the episode or provide any further details. The lack of confirmation has led many to question the validity of the claim. Some members of the Unsolved Mysteries subreddit speculated that the Reddit user may have confused Fleige with another show, or that the episode simply never existed. Without additional witnesses or concrete evidence, the tip remains unverified, and the Teddy Bear Man case continues to baffle investigators and the public alike. The resurgence of the teddy bear man case in 2022, sparked by the airing of Asted Norga and the subsequent Reddit post, briefly reignited hope that a decades old mystery might finally be solved. However, the lack of corroborating evidence and the inability to locate the alleged Flyga episode leaves the case as enigmatic as ever.
the story of the young man found in Hardanger Vida National Park with his worn teddy bear and uncertain identity remains a haunting reminder of the many unsolved mysteries that continue to evade resolution. Despite renewed interest, without further evidence or breakthroughs, the mystery of the teddy bear man is likely to remain just that, an unsolved enigma. Lost media always pervades my mind. It is a subsect of media that is infinitely interesting as it is unnerving. The idea that entire pieces of history, films, TV shows, broadcasts, recordings, can simply disappear or exist only in fragments, taps into something deeply unsettling. These forgotten or missing works often carry a strange allure as they hint at stories untold or experiences no one else may ever have again. Whether it is the infamous footage of a tragic event like Don Branchow's death at SeaWorld or long lost television broadcasts, the mystery surrounding their absence makes them all the more compelling. What draws me in is not just the media itself, but the stories behind why they became lost. The search for these missing pieces becomes not just a hunt for content, but for fragments of history and culture that have slipped through the cracks of time. Thanks again for being here with me tonight for this second entry into exploring lost media. Stay tuned for a very special Halloween episode of The Dark Hives. But until then, stay safe out there. Happy October, and good night.